Okay, welcome everybody um, to this webinar organized by the um, Unimed uh, subnetwork on e-learning and open education uh, of which you can see, you should be able to see in the, on the, in the background uh, our <laughs> website. And uh, we have the pleasure of having with us uh, uh, three members of the moment of the network that will of the subnetwork that will be presenting us the latest development in their institution and country. And then a couple of more are joining, so um, we should get uh, possibly more input a bit later. Uh, one word about the subnetwork. The subnetwork is, a, is a, um, an aggregation of, of some members of UNIMED plus other institutions that are active from the South Mediterranean region and from Europe. Who, which are active in the field of e-learning and open education and decided to uh, get together to focus their activities uh, in terms of knowledge exchange and promotion and uh, things like this webinar, for example, in this specific area. Uh, as you can see here, the subnetwork is, uh, um, I want to show you the members, it is uh, quite rich in terms of members. We have members from Albania, Algeria, Cyprus, France, Iraq, Jordan, Italy, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Oman, Palestine, Portugal, Spain, Tunisia, and the UK. So you can see it's probably the possibly the the among the Unimed subnetworks the one with uh, most of members. So this is uh, telling us something about the interest uh, uh, on this topic from the region. And uh, exactly this uh, this uh, event is a. Uh, is a classic moment of knowledge sharing, not only within the subnetwork, but also uh, among uh, external, uh, external stakeholders. Okay, so I suggest we start. Uh, we start uh, by having uh, um, the first presentation by, by, um, from okay, Algeria. I I we go, we start with Algeria. I think I, Adi is there? Yes. Yes, I am. Ah, okay, Adi, sorry, I didn't see you. Very good. So uh, I don't know if you have a, if you have a PowerPoint, Adi, or you wanna go, um, if, or you wanna go without. If you uh, can, I, yeah, I don't have a PowerPoint. I just want that, to make sure that uh, it seems that like that you hear me right now, right? Yes, I, we can hear you very well. I don't know if you can start your video also, so we can also see you. And uh, that's perfectly fine if you have no PowerPoint. This is just an informal update for the members and for and for other stakeholders. So I would like to give you the floor and uh, please uh, limit yourself to, yes, now I, I could see you for a moment. All right. Yes, I can see you there. Hello. So uh, please uh, start. You have some 10 minutes uh, to present the latest developments in your institution and uh, to update the subnetwork and uh, all the world in, um, about what's happening. Please. Mm, note that again, I was saying before, this uh, webinar is taking place during the Open Education Week. So, and it's uh, it's also an occasion for us to to promote uh, exactly the, the existence of many important practices in the in the region among international audiences. And so, thank you to everybody for being with us. And uh, Adi, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I I can uh, start with uh, sharing a uh, a PowerPoint slide that I prepared. But it seems to me that sharing is disabled by the host uh, for some reason. Let me um, see. I can send it to you via email if you can share it. Yeah, just send it to me by mailing. Okay. Because I, th I think if I make you host, then I will no more be the host. So then I don't know what's going to happen. So That's better true. to send it to me. All right. So In the meantime, you can start if you want. I think everybody should be able to see your face. For the moment. So can I send it to your uh, Gmail account? Yeah, fine. Okay, it 
be in your inbox shortly. So hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Unimed, uh, Christina, Fabio, and uh, all uh, colleagues who work together to make this uh, um, presentation happening. So what I would like to share with you to, tonight is um, just a little bit of update of where we're heading in uh, Princess Soma University specifically as a speaker or as a representative of uh, Jordan uh, in where they are heading with uh, open education in general. And then I would uh, move on uh, to my uh, specific topic. Uh, now that uh, Fabio is uh, sharing it, uh, I will just give a hint about uh, why are we doing this. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of open education, since the end of um, uh, our last uh, project, which was OpenMed, um, we kind of had uh, uh, several changes in uh, our regulations and our rules inside uh, PSUT so that we can also accommodate our learners. Uh, uh, in, in the country and in the region. So now we are beginning to widen our scope uh, to reach more to uh, neighbor countries like Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Syria for, for sure, and Palestine. Uh, so uh, I think that um, uh, the, our understanding of what open education really is and how can we invest in our in open education really help us, uh, this understanding, help us in uh, revisiting uh, the regulations that we already have in terms of online learning and e-learning as well as a, as a reactor to what open education is and uh, to uh, kind of move forward to uh, more advancements uh, to accommodate even more people. One of these advancements is actually adult learners. And this is actually the, the uh, title of my the topic uh, tonight. Uh, why am I choosing this type of uh, learners in specific? Because uh, from the um, uh, research that I've done so far on open education, uh, and I would say if, uh, from before as an e, uh, e, uh, for the e-learning umbrella, and then which I reached to education, and this culture, I think very often. Uh, and that's why I wanted to highlight this, because the objective of my presentation is just to give an opportunity to think about uh, the, uh, this sample of learners and see where they meet with open education. So I'm opening uh, some kind of opening the, uh, the discussion for everyone after I finish, uh, discussing the characteristics of what adult lear uh, learning uh, really is and what is an adult learner, how can we define them, how can we uh, have them in our courses and do they have room in open education or not? Uh, that's uh, the end. So uh, the main factors that I'm going to discuss are summarized in this slide. I'm going to share some eye-opening facts about adult learners, factors affecting the adult uh, the learning process, differences between children and adults in general, types of adult learners, four stages of learning, uh, the principles of adult learning, and uh, the retention levels, and finally, to summarize the whole thing with adult learning metrics. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay. I will get to start with the uh, uh, famous quote by Henry Ford when he said, anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. So I think that says many things about uh, the opportunity to learn and to have um, uh, open educational resources available for everybody because the door is open for everybody. Whenever you stop, you stop being young. Uh, that's according to Henry Ford move uh, to the next slide, please. So when we uh, put it in this way, if an instructor shows the learner how to do something or tells them how to do something, then teaching and learning has occurred. Do you agree with this statement or not? What do you think? Does anybody have any false. take? False, false. False. Okay. Oh, I hear it. I <laughs> I heard the false here. Oh, it, it depends. It depends. I hear and it, it depends. Okay. Can we move to the next slides? It's actually, um, up to some extent, it's false because um, uh, learning occurs only when the knowledge and skills are acquired and applied by the learner, him or herself. 
So uh, if there is no concrete application of uh, the acquired knowledge and skills, uh, that would be, you know, uh, really hard to consider that learning has happened. Uh, so uh, when we're talking about adult learners in specific, uh, that's wh wh what we really is. I, I would like to move to the next slide, please. And that would lead me also to the science of, the, of uh, understanding how adults uh, learn, which is called andragogy. Now, andragogy is the science, and I would say the art also of teaching adults. Because when you teach with adults, it's different than teaching children. Learners, or adult learners, I should say, decide what to learn, but not how and when to learn. I mean, they decide in the first place to the, uh, join a program uh, that is set under uh, an open, openly um, uh, licensed, uh, I would say, uh, uh, course uh, that they're going to use uh, so that uh, it's uh, pre-designed, it's pre-structured, uh, it's pre-structured as well. Uh, but the, uh, but the uh, decision itself to take a course is actually coming out of this adult learner. And andragogy is actually the science where we study the motives behind that. Malcolm Knowles uh, was a pioneer in this field, uh, um, sp uh, namely the adult learning field, and he started studying uh, like, I would say, the golden age of adult learning and putting it theories uh, was around the, in the year 1968. Can we move to the next one, please? And therefore, what Knowles really discovered, uh, many things. I would say uh, they kind of kept on going with many studies and many research afterwards to see some eye-opening facts about adult learners. They are as shown uh, in the front view, and I would uh, only pick uh, some of them to uh, discuss really quick. One of them is that many adult learners are extremely well-educated. They are well-educated at the, uh, the first place, but when they come, when they decide to take even more courses, and invest in uh, taking uh, uh, open uh, uh, courses for to learn any new skill, uh, they would have uh, a previous experience inside of them that you as an instructor can even learn from them or have some kind of collaboration between uh, among uh, uh, different uh, adult students. 80% of adult learners are between the ages of 25 and 45. This is the actually the age range that I found uh, really common among many studies out there. And, and um, there are some um, certain reasons for that. Uh, but then anyhow, I would say also that about 70% of the courses taken by adult learners are in their career fields. And about 40% receive some level of tuition assistance from employers. And this is very, very important because one of the motivations for adult learners, not only that they acquire and require new skills, but they also have the support, financially speaking, from their employers, from their companies, organizations, or from their own, uh, own business. So uh, they would not have this kind of anxiety that the 21st century student has uh, about how to pay for uh, education, how to get a proper education in, in a very well uh, reputed uh, uh, university or institution. And therefore, I would say that maybe open education here and even open a wider, uh, um, a more wide door, I would, uh, if I can put it this way, uh, for adult learners, since um, most of them are openly available for uh, everyone that to take. Can we move to the next slide? Yes, Adi, Adi please note that um, you have some uh, six or seven minutes more, over, all in all, since we have four speakers and we need to that's, finish. Uh, that's what I was going to ask about the time. Great. Okay. So factors affecting adult learners, uh, there are many of them, and I would just mention them to, uh, uh, to highlight the most important uh, that I think is, uh, one of them is the um, maybe anxiety and fear of uh, falling back behind, not uh, you know, developing um, enough or well enough to be uh, ahead of uh, the race of technological advancement or economical growth or name it, whatever it is. So there's a huge potential in gathering all of these motivations and that they will turn into factors affecting adult learning. Some of them are, um, for example, lack um, um, of confidence sometimes. If they uh, lack the confidence of continuing education, especially if that they spent most of their lives working and succeeding in many other fields, and now they decided to return back to school or return back to learning, or so to say, returning back to taking courses and returning back to being a student. To move to the next slide, please. 
Uh, yes. Okay. So here are the differences or main differences between uh, children and adults as learners. I would say one of them is that uh, children being dependent learners, they depend on somebody to tell them what to do, what to say, how to behave, and uh, to show them or train them on certain things. Uh, because um, by, inter uh, by the um, uh, extrinsic and intrinsic rewards that they get, they would still depend it. on the opposite side as uh, adult learners. They are independent learners. They do learning by, uh, 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 by voluntarily, I would say. They are very active, problem-centered, and most importantly, I would always emphasize on this one, that they are experienced learners. And even instructors can learn from their experience in opposite to the uh, children's side, which is inexperienced, of course, and uh, they learn for today, uh, not necessarily learning for the future, because they are still unaware, and they need uh, somebody to uh, well-educate them. To move to the next one, please. Types of adult learners, I can also uh, summarize them in five main categories. Uh, one of them is the dependent learners, although that I mentioned that, Dependent learner is more like a childish one or uh, the chil uh, ch children learners. Uh, but uh, even sometimes you would find an adult learner who is uh, aged between 25 and 50, and let's say so to speak, but they are still dependent. They need somebody to guide them along the way and they are not really ready to make all the decisions and uh, by themselves and not really self-directed. So we face this type as well. Independent learners, as we um, mentioned before, uh, we have the interdependent learners so that's kind of, you know, falling in between, between dependent and independent. Deductive and inductive, of course, uh, the, uh, these are the last uh, two categories. Two more time, please. Now, when we talk about adult learners, we also need to mention the four stages of learning, as mentioned by Bill Ford back in 1997. Uh, we have uh, four different stages. Um, the stage one is unconscious incompetence, which I can also rephrase as it's the phase when we don't know, we don't know. Simply as that, uh, especially if I want to take something in a course or uh, an open course about how to use Java to program new websites. I don't know anything about Java and I don't know if I'm able to code using Java. That's the stage. Uh, stage two is conscious incompetence. We don't, we know that we don't know, which is a very good one because you know exactly what you need to know in this stage. Now, in stage three is conscious competence. We know we can do, and the last one is that we can do, but we don't know we can do yet. So it's kind of a fuzzy thing to, to learn this way. But uh, uh, the main idea here to know is that there are uh, several stages, and they range from that I don't know something, or I don't know if I can do it. All the way to the stage is that uh, I, uh, I know what I need to learn because I know that I don't know it yet. So that uh, would give us uh, like a range of where an adult learner would fall, most likely in stage three or in stage four. That's where we find adult learners. To continue, please. And now for the principles of adult learning as proposed by Knowles, uh, there are 12 principles and um, most of them, as you can see, are intrinsic um, characteristics, like one of them is the motivation, they are self-directed. They look for relevance in the thing that they are studying. They are looking forward to having prompt feedback, like principle number nine. Uh, they expect that from their instructor, and they expect some kind of collaborative and uh, respective relationship with their instructor, because when you are dealing with adult learner, uh, you're dealing with someone who, may, who might be um, uh, older than you. Uh, and uh, there is some kind of also uh, a practical application of collaborative learning that is going on uh, continuously. To the next slide, please. Here I would ask of adult retention levels. And I always give this kind of uh, question to uh, everybody who listens to me that uh, what do you think that adults retain from what they read, percentage from what they hear, uh, how many uh, information would they get from what they see? and what they hear and see, what they say, and what they say and do. What do you think, in general, uh, has the most percentage? Do you think that we learn more if we read or if we say and do? What do which one do you think of these uh, uh, would gain the highest percentage? Of course, the last one, the percentage of what they say and do. That's because they say, they retain, and saying uh, maybe uh, includes hearing uh, and seeing 
and then therefore applying what they learned. So I can move to the next slide, please. And this is correct. According to many studies that the largest or the highest percentage is what we say and do means that we learned a lot, 90% of the material or uh, the, the least one is actually reading right now. Uh, the, comes next in hearing and etc. It's like related to the Chinese proverb that says, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I would understand and will never forget. Continue. Last but not least is the adult learning matrix. And uh, this is just to summarize the, uh, in terms of ability and attitude that we're all longing for the high ability and high attitude uh, for adult learners. I mean, uh, God, I love those learners with those who know what they do and know what they, why are here, they here. Uh, why are they taking this course with me? Because they have the high ability to complete this course and they have the high attitude to act like it, which is box four. This is the type of students that we are always, that we is, uh, we are always looking for. And uh, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Adi. Thank very you. interesting. Thank you. Virtual clap for you. Absolutely. <laughs> very interesting. And actually, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the areas where mostly of, of open education is, uh, is happening or could be happening in terms of continuous learning within and outside universities. I suggest you keep the, the questions for the chat because we don't have a lot of time and we wouldn't like to, to end up too late. So if you have questions, please use the, use the chat and uh, we will make sure that uh, Adi gets them. And now we move uh, to Nawal. Uh, now, Nawal Shoni Ben Abdellah, assistant professor from Mohammed Senk Rabat in uh, Morocco. I'm putting your slides, and if in the meantime you want to start, please, please yes. do, go ahead. Uh, do, you, do you hear me? <coughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, let's start. So, uh, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity to discuss all practices in Morocco. Um, I'm Nawal. Uh, I'm assistant professor in computer science at University of Mohammed Bank. In my presentation, I'm going to talk briefly on our motivations that driven us to consider seriously the e-learning in higher education. Then I'll name some fundamentals of a good e-learning course. After that, I'm going to present the ministry strategy and what was done regarding the project plan dress. Uh, so please, um, next slide. Uh, the university was created in 1957. It holds now 19 establishments, means eight faculties, five schools, and five research institutions, and one annex in Abu Dhabi. We count in 2018 around 85,107 students, divided into 79,818 students enrolled in the initial program and 5,289 are in Canton Win One for only um, 2,048 permanent educators. Uh, please, next slide. Consequently, and uh, next slide, yeah. Consequently, and based on the statistics that are related to only one university among others in the country, the implementation of digital pedagogy is privileged and is prioritized. It's uh, an opportunity to reduce the problem of massification, the low rate of educators. It is also an opportunity to bring closer learners in the isolated regions. In addition, it will give a chance to learners with disabilities uh, besides more other advantages. Please, next slide. Uh, so digital education represents an opportunity and acts as a catalyst for, uh, for change. You are with me? Uh, I see a little, uh, okay. This is the reason, um, uh, sorry. Um, besides it allows us to reach a better level that aligns quality, excellence, and innovation. This is the reason why all universities are called to provide a good quality of education to prepare our world to face the changes uh, of the new economic world. All this represents real challenges, as I suppose this is the case uh, in many other countries. Next slide, please. 
Well, what makes an e-learning course successful are the crucial role of the e-moderators in guidance, supervising, and motivating learners, the adequate technical support upstream and downstream of the process, the maintenance of learners' motivation, respecting the specifications, norms, and or standards, uh, and the granularity of the information uh, are important. This is without forgetting the specification of both general and specific objectives. Once these are defined, the appropriate activities and techniques of evaluation will follow the process to reach the objective. So, uh, in accordance with the national pedagogical norms, norms that are related to each model, the models are taught in a classroom, but only a part of these models can combine classroom and distance learning in accordance with the models description agreed on. Please next slide. Okay, so according to the Moroccan Ministry of Higher Education and regarding the strategy it addresses, the ministry is well aware of the importance of the use of information and communication technologies and digital for the modernization of Moroccan higher education. It has drawn up two action plans that already started in 2017 and should be finished by the year of 2021. The first one is the establishment of a unified uh, information system by generalizing distant, distance learning experiences. Uh, the second one is establishing the foundations of an e-learning system. Besides referring to the 2015-2030 strategic vision of the high... Hola, a ver, que cu oh, estoy complicado porque estoy, estoy, en, estoy en un call, de hecho. Le puse no. mute al call. <laughs> Interruption here. <laughs> Noises. <laughs> okay, I, I continue. I, uh, okay. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Uh, so I was talking about uh, the strategic vision of the Higher Council of Education. Uh, training and scientific research in ministry launched a project entitled uh, Generalization of the Use of the uh, of uh, new information and communication technologies in the field of higher education. The objectives of this project are uh, to develop the digital in the higher education system by following three steps. First, developing a mutual platforms for distance education within universities. Then after offering uh, to technical um, and pedagogical profiles training to develop their skills in, in this field. Then after that, creating a national virtual university. So regarding the setup of a national platform named, uh, named Maroc Université Numérique, uh, as before, uh, yes, this is the right slide, yeah, okay. Um, a partnership um, agreement uh, was signed on the 15th of July 2016 between the Ministry, the Public Interest Group, uh, GIP Fund, MOOC, and the Embassy of France. The link uh, of our national platform is shown in, uh, in the slide. Uh, this uh, white label platform will host massive open online courses, MOOCs, and small private open courses, or any other form of online course developed by Moroccan universities or existing ones. So following this agreement, a call for project MOOC was launched in April 2017 for public universities, higher education institutions, and other institutions in partnership within the ministry. After an evaluation carried out by peers uh, from Morocco France Commission, 49 projects were selected. The digital content produced um, is now accessible to yeah. all students of, uh, I mean, to, it's open for students of Moroccan universities and to anyone who is interested or who the content meets his or her needs. 
so please the last uh, uh, yeah so as a conclusion um, it is important to emphasize on the necessity to work in a partnership for to develop synergies between Moroccan universities and other international universities in terms of digital pedagogy. For example, by mutualizing our resources, especially for the development of uh, new and innovative approaches. Thank you very much. I'm brief and... <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yeah. Perfect, Nawal. You stayed into Thank the timing you. and you, you provided uh, very interesting information about uh, what's happening in Morocco during Open Med, uh, during the project we saw Morocco as a very dynamic country, not, uh, not, on, not the only one, of course, but uh, very dynamic in terms of new developments and the, the moon uh, uh, and, and also the, the creation, the launch of this virtual university in Morocco, which is not there. Actually, we have seen like the, how much the virtual university of Tunis has been useful as a catalyst for things to happen. So uh, let's say it's a very good news that uh, Morocco is also going to gonna get one and create one so we look forward to more news thank you very much thank you. we and oh, please for uh, for questions uh, keep on using the chat in case you have questions and we move now uh, we stay in the maghreb we move to algeria to ahmed bellani associate professor uh, of and, and head of the learning center at the university frère menturi constantin uh, ahmed the word the, the floor is yours and i'm trying to put on your slides in the Ahmed? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, please. You can start while I'm putting on the slides, if you want. Okay, I can't share my... Uh, I think that uh, you can... Uh, uh, okay, okay, you can. So, yes, I can uh, I can start. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Christina, for this invitation. So, uh, in uh, my presentation, uh, I, uh, I will uh, give some information about the uh, development and uh, and uh, projects in uh, EFNC in Ferrer University uh, around uh, blended learning and online learning. I start uh, by uh, presentations of uh, of uh, Ferrer Maturi of University Ferrer Maturi Constantin One. So the F, the, the uh, UFMC One is one of the first Algerian universities that emerged just after independence uh, built during the 70s. The university has uh, continued to develop and impose, uh, impose its uh, presence through uh, its multidisciplinary approach and the quality of education and training offered uh, to students. It's considered one of the leading uh, universities uh, at the regional and national level. To develop its training and join modernization, UFMC1 has adopted a novel strategy based on ICT integration in education. A learning center is installed to ensure these missions in the digital age. So uh, I am the head, the head of uh, eLearner Center. I'm a lecturer in automatics at the university and the same university. I have a master degree in education and technologies uh, from Sergi Pontois University, France. Uh, I am uh, the responsible of ACT integration training uh, ensured for teachers in higher education in Algeria. The missions of, of uh, e-learning center uh, of EFMC1, uh, the first mission is also the first uh, objective is the training of trainers on ICT in education. The second uh, mission is uh, participation on online master designing. And the third one is uh, collaboration in development of e-learning in several universities. The best practice in, uh, in EFMC1, the first one is training of trainers. So since 2012, UFMC1 has adopted a cycle of training that allows the teacher to integrate ICT in their education. The aim objectives are how to design a blended courses, how to use the, the Moodle platform, and how to build the, to build an online training. The second objective is a collaboration to enhance and improve the e-learning. 
So since uh, 2016, UFMC1 have been invited to ensure training of the teachers in higher education for several institutions and establishments in order to allow them to improve the quality of education by using e-learning. The third one is the participation in several e-learning projects. UFMC1 has participated in several international pro projects uh, like uh, projects on online learning and open education, like uh, Pompeius uh, EME project and essences uh, projects. Essences projects for uh, remote laboratory or e lab. The first, the fourth one is uh, so FMC1 has adopted an online master on legal sciences. The th uh, for development. FMC1 uh, studies the mechanism that allow motivations of students for uh, follow uh, blended learning and uh, encouragement of teachers that adapt the blended courses in their education. The second one is think about how to adapt the MOOC in the education. And the third one is how to generalize the remote laboratory or e-lab in uh, education. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much. This was a yeah. fantastic panorama. I mean, so many things are happening in the university and it's, uh, I mean, this is a richness for, for actually our work in the, in the, our joint work in the, in the, in the sub-network. And uh, <coughs> all of this, I, a quick question, all of this is happening in, uh, in French mainly and in Arabic, right? Is, is yes. th th this is happening mainly in French and in Arabic, right? In Asia. I don't, I don't understand, Fabio. C'est tous les choses que vous avez que, que vous avez dit. Il ça se passe en français et en arabe. C'est correct? Non, non, c'est en anglais. La présentation en anglais. Oui, oui, la présentation, oui, bien sûr. Mais les cours et les, 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 les ah, développements. Ah, ok, les cours, oui, yes, oui, yes, cours. Uh, ok, ok. Non, non, il y a des cours pour c'est-à-dire uh, les cours construits par les enseignants. Oui. Et, uh, donc uh, des cours pour en arabe, en anglais, en français. Donc tout dépend de la discipline enseignée. Ok. Perfect. Okay, no, I was just checking about the language for the ones not speaking French. So it's um, French, Arabic, and English. So it's uh, <coughs> even more interesting for for international uh, international collaboration. Thank pardon, you very much. Uh, yeah, pardon, we, there is there is an Italian courses for other university in uh, in Algiers uh, University like Algiers two and one and third uh, Algiers. The teachers designed and. Uh, Designed and met and uh, put their courses in Italian or uh, or Dutch or Russian. Uh, that depends on uh, on field uh, teaching. Okay, so Italian is uh, yes. interesting. Interesting. Yes, thank you. Total multilingual. Thank you very much again. Okay. Merci beaucoup and congratulations for all of this. And we move now to Palestine for the last but one presentation. We have uh, Khalid Kamfar, director of the e-learning center, and Yasmin Abu, Har Abu Hasirach, sorry for my pronunciation, head of the training department in the e-learning center from Palestine Technical University. And uh, so again, another important uh, e-learning center in another important university. So please, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Khaled Khanfar, the director of e-learning center at Palestine Technical University, uh, Kaduri. Uh, the just uh, uh, the first part is uh, talking about the importance of uh, going with the technology. So as you see here, it's, uh, it's even the KG students now uh, deal with the technology. So uh, we have to uh, enable all of them to use the uh, technology effectively. So if we teach today's uh -huh. students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of 
tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. So next slide, please. Well, uh, the 21st century uh, curriculum is basically uh, concentrating on the students. So uh, it's a student-centered uh, approach. Uh, if we look back a little bit at 20th century classroom, so we will uh, see that the focus was on the uh, teacher, but nowadays the focus is on the learner or the uh, student. Uh, as a result, the complete infrastructure has to be uh, re-engineered uh, for the leaders, for the students, for the instructors, for the family, all of them. And now we have different models that uh, uh, help us or enable us to uh, apply or to use this technology to have a, a students or a learners, let's say learners, uh, with high capabilities. So the most or the famous one is the Bloom's Digital Taxonomy. By applying the technology, we can uh, put our students at the top of the pyramid. So the aim is to have uh, these students uh, to be creative students. So without uh, technology, it's, it's going to be difficult uh, to achieve this. So this will speed up the process of putting our learners in the top of the pyramid uh, uh, to be a creative uh, learners. And we have different uh, famous models, which is the SEMAR model, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, Maslow use of technology. Next slide, please. In Kaduri, uh, we are uh, we are moving uh, slowly but surely. We have our plan uh, is by the end of this year to have all courses as a blended courses. This is the first part. Now the second phase is to have some courses to be as a pure online courses, which we hope to have this by the end of this year and to start uh, some courses as pure online courses. Now, the third thing in our uh, goal is how to integrate the IOT in the academia. I'm not talking about controlling things like ACs, like buses, no. How to integrate the IOT in the academia itself. For example, the registration, the application, all of these things, when the students enters, uh, enter the, the campus, then the IOT will help them. And the last uh, part or the last phase is to have our own virtual branch, completely uh, a virtual branch. And we hope to have this by the end of uh, next year. Now, the main problem we are facing is what is called the zones of change in any, in any uh, firm. Uh, you know that we have four different zones. We have the apathy zone, we have the anxiety zone, we have the comfort zone, and we have the learning zone. So basically, uh, the, uh, uh, we still uh, in the apathy zone, and we hope to, to, to overcome this zone by the end of this year. And then we will move 
hopefully to reach the last zone, which is the learning zone, which, which the actual online environment then will take place, where the interaction between the learners, the students, uh, with the students, the students with teachers, teachers with teachers, researchers with researchers, and hopefully to have this by the end of uh, next year. And now I will pass uh, over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Yasmin, to talk about, uh, about us in, uh, in Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Hello, everybody. Okay, um, now I will talk about uh, the e-learning center. It is, uh, was established uh, in Kaduri since 2011. The center was established to provide the services uh, in, collab in co collaboration with various um, faculties in the university according to the strategic plan of the university. Um, and um, the role of uh, the center is to be responsible and uh, develop e-learning courses in, um, and um, delivery electronic services to students and lectures. Next slide, please. Okay, now uh, about the uh, objectives, we are um, looking forward to supervise all the e-learning activities at the Duke University and manage the e-learning website, also provide the training for university staff, which is my um, career and uh, as a head of training department in the e-learning center. Here is the structure of our uh, e-learning center um, the, direct, the Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Director of E-Learning Center, Prof, Professor Dr. Khaled. Um, then we have um, <coughs> real four departments and we looking forward this year to um, add uh, five, uh, the, five, the fifth department, which is EBWB <coughs> and the Quality Assurance Department, because we are looking forward to um, control the electronic pedagogy in our university uh, and programming <coughs> about the training department actually I would like to talk about it uh, here um, my focus uh, in this department is to provide all academic staff and also the students uh, with every technical support and how to use digital learning environment in our um, e-learning center, we use the um, learning environment model, and I focus on working with instructors on how to use Moodle in our courses, and we actually make workshops and video tutorials and manuals for the academic staff. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, here is a small statistics according to uh, weekly workshops. Um, in our department, uh, in training department, actually, uh, each, uh, every week, we have two workshops per week. So we offer two workshops for um, different uh, faculties. For example, here we can see Faculty of Engineering and Technology, Faculty of Applied Science, College of Arts and Educational Sciences, Academics, Business and Economics, Faculty, College of Agricultural Sciences and Academics, and the Palestine Technical College for Diploma. So here we can see that this statistics shows how workshops work per week. Next slide, please. Now here we can see the uh, DLL, DLE, which is a digital learning environment. There is many types of uh, digital uh, or learning LMS, learning management system. We use here Moodle because it's free open source and it is very easy to use um, in our station right now. We are uh, looking forward to use other, but now we are concentrate on using LMS and in the future, maybe we can move to other digital learning environment. But right now we use Moodle. Next slide. Here is uh, why we use Moodle. Here is um, uh, from what's, uh, website. It's uh, captira.co. 
we can see the top 20 most popular LMS software. This is statistics uh, is um, on October 2018, and we can see the first one is Edmodo uh, LMS, and the second one is Moodle. Third one is Blackboard, and as shown in the graph, we use Moodle, the second one. Next slide, please. Okay, now uh, we looking. We are working on um, develop the version of Moodle, and we now work on um, running on Moodle that we coded in UPS as a current version. But now we do testing for the new version 3.5 of Moodle version. So now we do we use uh, two versions of Moodle, one uh, old and which is work on it and have a workshop on it. And we do testing for the latest version of Moodle for testing issues. And when finished testing phase, we will work on the new version next year. Next slide, please. Some photos of our activities. We make a workshop, as we see in the pictures. Kaduri have three branch in Palestine. Um, the first and the, the main branch is in Tulkarim city, and we have a um, branch in Ramallah city, and we have a branch in Arub in Hebron city. So our workshops uh, are among all the branches in uh, Kaduri. So here are some of our workshops among the year. Next slide. Thank you very much. And looking forward to ask us any question and hear from you yep. if you have any ideas. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, very interesting also to well, basically to know more about the different learning centers. Also in this case, very, very complete information. Thanks a lot. Uh, before moving to FASI, I have a question um, for Nawel. Uh, the question is the following is in the chat. Uh, the courses of Moon uh, well, are for free and open access for all, like edX and FUN, or are reserved only for your university and for Moroccan university? It's a question from Ahmed Belhani to understand to know the level of openness of the Moon courses. Okay, so uh, our courses are open for our students if it's a, a small private open course. Uh, but if it's a massive open course, uh, it's open for everyone. Uh, and it depends on the choice of the, um, the professor uh, or the owner of the course to define whether it's uh, open for everyone or it's uh, uh, small or specific for um, a specific number of students. Yeah, when you speak about small courses, it's like in, like in fun, no? These are courses specifically for... Uh, smaller groups, let's say, that then might become open in, in the next phase, if I understand right. Um, in general, this is the strategy uh, we follow. First, it's a uh, small private to, to see uh, how it works, then we open for everyone. This is uh, what we recommend to our professor uh, at the first uh, stage of, uh, of uh, when, when they, they, they launch their, uh, their course. Okay, thank you very much. We, we don't want to be rude uh, to our Lebanese colleague uh, Fazi, who is uh, the last speaker of the of the session. So, Fazi, the floor is yours. I, I suggest we take five minutes more uh, after after the the expected end time to hear about the OER Lebanon and about the work uh, the work that is going on in your university. Uh, and Fazi is asking uh, if any of the universities participating have developed an OER policy. Ah, you start with the question, your intervention. I see. <laughs> you want to challenge people. Okay. The floor is yours. You can ask the question. And people, please reply, reply also by using the chat. Uh, uh, right. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Fauzi Baroud uh, from Beirut, Lebanon. My uh, university name is Notre Dame University. And uh, uh, we adopt the American system of study. And uh, I've met uh, some of you, you know, while I was uh, participating in the Open Math project as a guest. And uh, well, what I would uh, like to share with you today 
is my experience championing the uh, OER initiative in uh, Lebanon. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm the Assistant Vice President for Information Technology. Uh, this is one of the things I do. And uh, also, uh, uh, I uh, did establish the University E-Learning Center back in 2000 uh, uh, at the Notre Dame University. Uh, I, I will not talk uh, much about the e-learning center and, uh, you know, the, uh, but we quickly, you know, I can say, you know, we're, we're using, uh, uh, since the year 2000, uh, we use a Blackboard uh, uh, as our uh, learning management system. Uh, we have uh, Moodle installed for, uh, at the university, but, you know, mainly the official uh, uh, LMS at the university is uh, Blackboard. Uh, what I would like to share with you is my experience and, le and the lessons learned uh, throughout since 2014 uh, by integrating, by championing the open education resources at my university and at the national level. National level, I mean uh, in Lebanon. And of course, you know, I've been everywhere in the Middle East uh, giving workshops, presentation concerning my experience. Uh, uh, actually, you know, like uh, I, I am, I, I am working with uh, uh, OER because I do believe it. I have a passion about open education, open education resources because I do believe uh, the importance for open education resources for our uh, faculty member, for our students, for our kids in the future. Okay, so uh, uh, what we have now, I can say at the university because I started since 2014 uh, and I was alone when I came back from the state, you know, where I learned about op the open movement, what's happening there. I came back to my university and I thought, you know, I, first of all, you know, I met with the leadership of the university, the president and the dean. And of course, you know, I conducted a workshop telling them what's happening uh, uh, in this area worldwide. So, uh, and since then, I've been, I've been doing uh, what we call awareness uh, uh, workshop at the university. Uh, uh, and now after maybe four or five years, you know, I, we have a culture of, you know, it's, it's still young, I would say, but we have a culture at the university uh, of uh, talking, people talking about OER. So uh, uh, at the university level, and the things I have uh, uh, learned, okay, supporting OER, and while I was supporting OER, and this is something, you know, I'd like to share with you and, you know, people who are attending this webinar. First of all, and uh, of course, you know, all the things we have done, uh, all the courses that I will talk about later on, that it's been converted from tra traditional, using open, yeah, using traditional textbook now, they are using, uh, instructor are using open educational resources. The, the, the first thing, you know, that I, we have learned is <coughs> instructors uh, in your university should be convinced about the benefits of OER. Yeah, and this is one thing you have to make sure. They, they have to know, they have to understand why uh, uh, OER is important. And, you know, here you can talk about, you know, there are plenty of uh, uh, open textbook, OER, MOOC, whatever you want to call it, you know, they are there. And this is, it's gonna be good for uh, so many things. First of all, if you wanna talk about cost, it will reduce the cost for our students. Imagine, you know, like uh, our student here at the university, they have to buy the, the, the book. You know, the book, it's not uh, uh, something that, you know, it, it is offered by the university. They have to pay for it. And, you know, in courses like mathematics, biology, chemistry, all those courses, you know, it costs too much money. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the cost for our students so that, you know, they can use this cost for uh, tuition fees or whatever. Another thing is, another important factor for our faculty member at Notre Dame University uh, was uh, the quality of OER because, you know, uh, always, you know, like faculty member, if they don't know where to find OER, well, they tell you, well, you Google it on the internet, maybe it's not of good quality, but, you know, this is your role as educator or uh, as, you know, OER champions or people who are working at the thing is to convince and show your faculty members where to find a, a, a quality OER material. And there are plenty of them, plenty of them which are 
open, openly available that you can translate to Arabic, you can, you can uh, adopt, you can adapt, you can do whatever you want to do on one condition is to use the appropriate and the correct license which is attached to whatever resource you find. And another uh, important uh, uh, lesson I have learned is the collaboration between instructors with common interest is important. For example, and this is what's happening uh, at my university. For example, now, uh, uh, instructors who are teaching uh, maths, for example, one of the professors, uh, he, he, was now, he is now uh, uh, giving workshop for other instructors in the math department, explaining to them how he transformed his calculus course, okay, from uh, using an open, uh, a, a traditional textbook uh, to open educational resources, and they are doing what a kind of collaboration about topics uh, in mathematics. If we go to the English department, let's say now I have the English department, this is the, uh, my third year now, that we have uh, more than three courses, and we're talking about you know, thousands of students because we have multi-section of those uh, courses, that instructor who attended uh, my workshops and moreover, they were part of the open med learning circle that, you know, when, when uh, with the open med project. And those instructors attended the online course and it was very beneficial for them. They learned a lot from this uh, course, which was developed by UNIMED. So they are collaborating now on, uh, 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 on courses like public speaking, for example. And moreover, what those instructors this year are doing, they are involving the student. And yani now our students who are attending, for example, a public uh, speaking course, the students now are aware of that the, they have to videotape their presentation, they have to attach a Creative Commons license to whatever project, so that other students at the university or somewhere else can learn from uh, uh, their speeches or uh, their project or what, whatever they have done for to satisfy the requirement of this specific course. Another thing, you know, that I have learned is that the instructor, you cannot leave the instructor, you cannot leave faculty member on their own. You need to give them support. For example, you know, I've heard uh, colleagues now talking about the e-learning center, the university e-learning center. And, you know, you have to give them the right tools and you have to give them the appropriate training. So. Instructor needs support they, uh, all the time. And then, of course, when we talk about uh, 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 lesson learn, uh, the, the, you know, supporting uh, OER and preaching about OER, it is difficult, but, you know, I can tell you from my experience, it's, if you believe in it, it's, uh, it's not uh, impossible. Yani. It is possible uh, to do it. Another thing I have learned at the institution level, you know, when, you know, like you, you are in an institution, you are in a, a university, right, setting. There is this hierarchy of, you know, reporting and stuff like that. My advice to you is work on a policy. And this is what we're doing right now. We are at the university trying, we have a committee from different faculties, from the political science, from the business school, from the engineering school. We have members, we are working on a policy. Without a policy, okay, the policy will, uh, will give direction, will give all the, you know, the scope of what you're doing, of faculty member, what they're supposed to do. It gives direction about what type of open license that they should be using. So the policy is something very, very, very important. Another thing, if you can do it, I don't know, you know, it can be in, in, in different uh, models, but, you know, you have to establish a reward system. When I say reward system, it means you have to give an incentive for faculty. Because faculty members, they will tell you, what is it for it? I'm going to put time, I'm going to, you know, like take a, a lot of time to prepare my courses, find resources, look if it's good resource, not good resource. So you need to create a reward system. Reward system, it can be, for example, a, a small amount of money. It might be. Or it might be, for example, if a professor is teaching, let's say, three courses uh, or four courses, you, you know, the administration, you can suggest to your administration that, you know, instead of teaching four courses, let this instructor teach three courses and the other time will use it to transform his course from what we call traditional course to 
a, a course which is supported by open education resources. Another uh, thing that, you know, at the institution level, you know, like it should come from the leadership, you know, they, they, the, the leader, the vice president of academic affairs should uh, uh, encourage a culture of sharing and collaboration, sharing and collaboration. You know, we don't like to share, people don't like to share, but you know, things have to change because, you know, if, if we share, because if we talk about education, it's all about sharing. There is no education without uh, sharing. And of course, another important thing is because instructors say, well, I have a video, I have a resource, I have, I have, I have, where should I put it? So another important thing at the institution level is to uh, uh, develop what we call an institutional repository. And this is what we have done at the university. I involved the library, the library at the university uh, I gave them all the tools, I gave them all the technical help because I'm in charge of the IP department, uh, you know, to uh, create what we call a DSpace. And DSpace is an open uh, uh, digital repository <clears throat> and they will be managing it, the workflow, how, you know, somebody can uh, uh, publish in this institutional repository with the tagging, indexing, stuff like that. And we already launched this institutional uh, repository. Okay, so those are a couple of uh, recommendations uh, for uh, uh, institution. And for those of you, my dear friends and colleagues, uh, let me tell you one thing. Uh, you sh if you believe in this open movement, you know, you, you, you know, you should be patient. And as everything in life, you know, if you are trying to change this old system, you know, this that exist in universities. I've been in the education for the past maybe 30 years now, okay? Uh, uh, and if you want to champion this change, that, don't take it personal. Don't say, well, you know, people, uh, I'm having hard time with this initiative, okay? It is, you cannot do the change by force. You cannot enforce the change. You know, you have to uh, listen to everybody, you have to listen to their opinions, you know, uh, listen to, you know, people who, who are with your thoughts and bring them on board. And this is what I have done. If you look at the Open Education Week this year that, you know, uh, and you is participating, the year before and before, I used to be the champion everywhere. My name is in the everyday uh, giving a presentation. This year, you know, starting yesterday and today, for example, let me just tell you, I had yesterday an uh, uh, instructor from the political science telling about his experience, how he transformed his course, leadership and ethic to OER. Uh, today, I had a couple of instructors from uh, teaching public speaking from the English department giving their uh, uh, testimonials. Tomorrow, uh, there is a, a professor from the mathematics department. He will tell his colleagues and other faculty member, how he transformed a course in mathematics to complete open educational resource and so on and so forth. And I left myself to the half an hour on Friday for the closing session and success story. So things, you know, when you bring champions on board, those champions, you know, will, will help you out with whatever initiative uh, uh, you are trying to do. Another thing is, listen, uh, this is my advice. Listen, give equal platform and maintain your position always of why you're doing this and not the how of to do this. Yani you know, why you're doing this because you believe in it. You believe the importance of open education and OER for our faculty members, for our uh, uh, students. Another point, if I have, if I may, uh, Fabio, I still have three minutes. Uh, two. Two, okay, uh, two minutes. Uh, uh, what I'm doing, what I've been doing is I moved from the university to uh, the, at the national level. I've been uh, uh, training a school teacher because they are now in Lebanon. There is a center called the Center for Education, Research and Development and it is the right arm of the Ministry of Education and Higher Education. And they are, this center is in charge of writing uh, the Lebanese curriculum for K to 12 uh, teachers. Okay, so what I've done is I've, I, I gave them around 15 workshops 
from the licenses, from what's open education, OER, where to find them, to the final project that those team of responsible at the center, they could publish and create a complete book using open education resources, which is dynamic, which is not static with all the videos, with the animation, with the simulation, which is, uh, and this is something I'm doing at the national level. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, one more thing, uh, maybe he can, uh, Fabio, show the OER Lebanon. You can just go to OER yeah, Lebanon. Yes, I, I put it on the, I put it in the chat so that people can just yeah, click OER, it. Uh, you know, the, what, yeah. what missing, we still need in the Arab country, in the Middle East here, we need, we need to talk more to each other. We need to share our experience. We need, you know, Fabio and Unimed and uh, the State Department and, uh, you know, they're they are excellent people, you know, they share, they are helping, but we need more in the Arab country and in my opinion, this is my opinion, because, you know, we need more to be, to collaborate more, to share our experiences, you know, and I'm ready if uh, uh, any any help, any 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 anything you need from mm. me uh, in the this open movement, you know, I'm ready to support and help. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Fazi. Actually, thank you. actually, I'm glad that this webinar is being recorded because your recommendations will will could become a sort of a manifesto of the of the subnet, or because actually. I think you, you, you went through the whole process and somehow you, you know actually the difficulties. Now every country and every institution is very different from each other. So I'm not saying that your experiences can be replicable, but actually the principles of what you've been doing, I think uh, actually I'm tempted to, to send you an email asking you to put this in writing because this could really become a sort of a mini guideline no? for somebody that wants to, wants to do this. Okay, so thank you very much, and also for the for the final claim about about collaboration. That is why we are here, actually, to 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 know to know more about about uh, about each other. Uh, time is uh, is uh, after us. Uh, there are other webinars taking place at the very moment in the, during the, this Open Education Day within the Open Education Week. So, I'm uh, I, I will have to close this one, but uh, I would just like to. Thank everybody for your participation and uh, let you know that uh, through the, the subnetwork you can keep on collaborating and, uh, and uh, well, thank you very much and see you online and offline very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Fabio. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Shukran jazeelan, yani. Shukran komptir. Fursa sa'ida. Shukran jazeelan lakum jami'an. Shukran jazeelan. Inshallah, naltaqi. Naltaqi amma qarib, inshallah. دكتور بالنسبة للسمر في ما بعرف إذا كنتوا أوير أو في شيء اسمه ال ال I C T C F T يونسكو I C T C F T فريمورك ال لأنه أنت حكيت عن السمر موديل they have a very good framework اللي اسمه I C T C F T version three now and it is a very this is an excellent framework that you can use uh, it's competency